Thank you very much. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Gabby and his group uh, to kick on seven of this project. Gabby is as a postdoc at IPHP and uh, is generally interested in DSM physics, more particularly in Higgs physics and phenomenological applications of physics. Uh, today he'll tell us about uh, Higgs coupling here. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction and for being here. Uh, so this is uh, what I want to talk about is some work that I did with uh, people in Saclay where I am based. So with Raffaele Dagnolo and then Florian, who's uh, also a postdoc in Saclay and uh, Pablo, who is a PhD student. And uh, also I will be here in Chicago for about a month from now. So if you hate my talk, you have plenty of time to come. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So just to set the stage for, for what I want to talk about, uh, as you know already, uh, particle physics deals with very basic questions uh, at, the, at the foundation of uh, what it is. And some examples are well, what is the origin of mass? Where does mass come from at the fundamental level? Or what is the universe made of, let's say, the composition of the universe? And uh, answering these questions uh, leads you to uh, different parts of particle physics. So the first one uh, is associated with the, with the Higgs boson. And then if you, you know, dig deeper into what the Higgs boson is, you encounter the hierarchy problem. Uh, while the other question uh, has to do with uh, dark matter and dark energy, which make up, as we know, a big portion of uh, the universe that we know. Uh, and, uh, okay, these, these questions are quite deep and people have been thinking about them for, for a long time, of course. And uh, they are, you know, fundamentally different questions, but uh, conventionally or typically one of the things that they have in common is that uh, they, lead to a, they lead to a common prediction, which is the presence of uh, new physics uh, around the weak scale. Okay. So in the case of the hierarchy problem, you are dealing with the question of uh, why the Higgs boson uh, is at the scale where we found it. So why is it, uh, in a certain sense, lighter than uh, we, we should expect? And in the case of dark matter, well, you expect some new states and uh, in the case in which your dark matter is, uh, let's say, coming from uh, some weak interactions and some other extensions of the standard model, you might expect dark matter to show up also around the weak scale. Okay, so that's why they have this prediction in common. And uh, okay, so in, in a sense, uh, when we started, you know, dealing with LHC and experiments at the weak scale, this was our expectation. Okay, so that we would turn on LHC, we would start taking data, and we, there would be a bunch of apples that we'd have to pick, okay? A bunch of particles that we would find, uh, you know, first the Higgs, uh, but then uh, also, you know, a plethora of other particles that uh, in the case of the hierarchy problem would have to be, would, would uh, be related to uh, the solution that we, that nature had chosen to, to solve the hierarchy problem, okay? So to give you some, just a concrete example, you know, the, the typical solutions can be, let's say, supersymmetry. So we expected that uh, we at LHC, we would have found the Higgs and we would have found some supersymmetric particles that would have told us uh, how the mass of the Higgs boson uh, was you know, regulated, how the corrections to the mass of the Higgs boson were canceled by the presence of these supersymmetric particles and why uh, we eventually got the Higgs boson around the weak scale. Another example, uh, let's say, that also has to do with, to do with new symmetries uh, is a class of models that can be composite Higgs models in which you also expect some strong dynamics to arise around the weak scale, explain why the Higgs is there, uh, and then you would expect uh, the presence of uh, other uh, composite states from this uh, strong dynamics to show up around the same scale at which uh, the Higgs gets uh, corrections to its, to its mass, and then uh, also that would also explain why the Higgs mass is around 125 GeV, where we want it. So, okay, the picture is 
this garden with plenty of apples and you know eventually we got something quite different okay we've got just one apple uh, which was you know a different story and of course it's great that we found the Higgs at LHC but uh, in a certain sense we are also quite disappointed because we, we wanted we wanted something else okay uh, and uh, so so you know uh, it's it's a different from from the expectation that we had before we started collecting data and uh, this difference between our expectation and reality has also uh, shifted a bit the attitude of, of particle physicists in their in the kind of work that we do. So, you know, first, before LHC or, you know, a while ago when people were working a lot on supersymmetry and composite Higgs, uh, the attitude was generally that of working on model building. So uh, you would uh, try to construct theories uh, and work out the details of these theories that were able to explain the Higgs mass. And so you would uh, uh, you would deal with the, with the details of the different models and try to uh, find the most sophisticated one, the better one, uh, to exactly tell you, uh, you know, why, what we should expect and uh, how to put everything together with the experimental data that, uh, that we had at the time. You don't like it? I mean, it's just... Okay, I'll, I'll delete it for the next <laughs> Yeah, but okay. So, so this is like the model building kind of creative uh, aspect of particle physics. Okay, the different aspect of particle physics is kind of the strict, the strict one. Uh, okay, so the the attitude nowadays is quite different in the sense that now, well, it's been a while and we haven't found any new particles other than the Higgs at LHC. So the attitude is that of interpreting everything in a model independent way uh, from the point of view of effective field theories. Uh, which means that uh, you can use the data you collect uh, to put bounds on operators uh, that uh, extend uh, uh, of that parameterize physics beyond the standard model in a model model independent way, uh, and this is in the form of uh, uh, yeah, in the form of putting bounds on the coefficient of the higher dimensional operators. Okay. So these are the two kind of attitudes that that we had. Uh, you know, in time, and uh, of course, each of them has uh, its merits. Okay, they are perfectly good strategies in looking for for new physics. Uh, but uh, it's also a shame that I mean, it, it's uh, it's it's nice if there is a way that we can take the best of each of the two uh, and try to try to see if we can come up with something uh, different. And so today, what I will try to do is to give you an example uh, of a case in which we found that this is possible. Okay. All right, yes. So just to give you also um, the motivation for, for what I want to talk about, uh, the general idea, uh, which you might have already know, but let me remind you, uh, is that, okay, in general, in a theory in which you extend the standard model with some new physics, um, you have some new contributions to the Higgs mass uh, in terms of, in relation to the hierarchy problem, as I was saying before. So you might write some diagrams uh, like in the first line there, uh, you have the contributions to the Higgs mass coming from the standard model, and you have different contributions coming from uh, physics beyond the standard model. And if you are to solve the hierarchy problem, uh, these new contributions have to explain why the Higgs mass is what it is. On the other hand, when, when you have new states beyond the standard model, Generically, very often, it's the case that also uh, the, you can write similar diagrams in which the production and the decay processes of the Higgs are affected, okay? And it's, it's, very, it's very general that once you have the diagrams of the first kind, you also have the diagrams of the second, which means that when you are trying to explain the Higgs mass, uh, typically you also have modifications in Higgs count. And okay, this is a nice picture, it's a qualitative picture, uh, but it would be nice to make a statement which is model independent in this spirit, uh, which means trying to find a model independent way of relating uh, couplings or deviations of couplings in the Higgs uh, to a naturalness, let's say to the scale at which new physics might, uh, might show up, okay? And in this sense, I mean naturalness in a in a in a generic sense. Okay, so let's just say the scale of new physics. So I'm not 
I'm not trying to necessarily make a specific statement about lateralness, but I'm kind of implying that if there is new physics and in particular new bosons at some scale, that will teach us uh, something about whether our theory is natural or not. And I will explain more about uh, what I mean exactly by that. Okay, so let me just give the, the outline of what I want to do. I'll just describe in general what the pieces that go into the argument I want to make are. Uh, then I will dig a little deeper into the details of uh, our calculations and our process. And then finally, I will show you uh, some plots and uh, some results. So just to make very clear uh, what, what my goal is, uh, this is the starting point, okay? So just suppose that there is some deviation uh, in some couplings of the Higgs, like HWW uh, or HCZ, and that we, we actually measure it. Okay, then the question that we ask is, what can we say uh, about uh, the scale of new bosons? Okay, in particular, new bosons, not, not only new bosons. Okay, and I will show you uh, how it is possible to make, again, a concrete statement uh, uh, in, in this way. So what is the logic of, of the thing we're trying to do? Uh, well, the point, again, is that we want to put a bound on the scale of new bosons depending on a deviation in, in those couplings of the Higgs. So the idea is that you can work by contradiction, okay? You can, you can make so, sort of a proof by contradiction, which means, well, if you want to bound new bosons, first you start by assuming that you have no new bosons, okay? So you only extend the standard model with new fermions, okay? Assu by assumption, there are no new bosons at this stage. Now, uh, if you want to uh, explain this deviation in the couplings of the Higgs with new fermions at the renormalizable level, the way you can do it is by writing some Yukawa coupling between these new fermions and the Higgs. And those would have the effect, of course, of generating the deviation in the couplings of the Higgs. Uh, but the point is that actually the result of adding these new fermions with this Yukawa interaction is twofold. So one, Yes, they generate that modification in the couplings of the Higgs if you choose appropriately how you couple them to the standard model. Uh, but also uh, what, what, I will, what I will show is that they actually generate an instability in the theory, which means that they make the theory, uh, at some point they make the theory inconsistent, okay? By modifying the renormalization group evolution of the, of the standard model. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that uh, these new fermions are responsible for both the both the deviations and the instability is exactly why we are able to relate these things. Uh, and now uh, this means that uh, while when you find that this instability shows up, uh, I will I will tell you in a second why you can interpret actually that as the scale uh, where new bosons might must show up. Okay, so that you can interpret that as the scale of new bosons. And uh, by uh, changing the masses and the representations of, of these new fermions that uh, I introduced, you can actually make a model independent statement. So you can make your analysis model independent by, by changing the masses and the representations. And uh, also by choosing in this variation process the most conservative upper bound than, if, than you get on the scale of new bosons, uh, you can, uh, again, you can be model independent and you can make a model independent statement on this scale. I also want to highlight that this similar logic also has been used in these papers, which were from a few years ago, where Raffaele was also involved. And the difference mainly is that they were not as generic with the representations that they were choosing for the new fermions. So they were not, as a consequence, as model independent as we were in this paper. And also they were focusing on different couplings uh, so not HWW and HCZ, and I will explain why the couplings that we focus on in this specific paper are actually uh, particularly useful. Here are both L and M possible. What's the that one of them is standard? No, we're assuming that they are both new fermions. Yeah. You can also, uh, well, depending on the representations of these new fermions that you introduce, there is also the possibility that you couple them uh, as you said, with standard model fermions, but 
it, that doesn't uh, that doesn't change very much our result uh, since we're trying to be again as conservative as possible with the scale of new physics that doesn't really change the conclusion so we, we restricted ourselves to uh, such as yeah, yeah, I will explain exactly which, which representations you can take, and uh, yeah, this will be a, well, a significant part of the talk. But yeah, in general, the spoiler is that uh, yeah, typically you can take them to be singlet and then okay. So in a sense, I mean, so just to summarize so far, okay, the point is that you can calculate. Uh, a relationship between a deviation in couplings of the peaks and the scale of impulse. Okay, so this, in a sense, is not surplus, is not very surprising. Okay, you might, you know, it's something that you probably already expected. Uh, so it's not gonna, you know, probably blow your mind that we find this relationship. But uh, I think it's still nice that uh, we can show that it's possible to do it in a model independent way and uh, to, you know, turn this picture into a quantitative statement about this point. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, they're just uh, we we just focus with swing on that. Yeah, just uh, okay. So let me tell you a bit more about these new fermions that we introduced. Okay, so so far the starting point is that they they can be as general as possible to again make a model independent statement, but there are a few considerations that we can make to restrict our analysis. Okay, so we can set our some reasonable uh, requirements on these new fermions. Uh, and one in particular is that we want them to be, well, by assumption, responsible for this deviation that we assume we're able to measure in the, in the discoveries. The second point is that, well, we want them to be consistent with the experiment, okay? We don't want to deal with a theory that's already excluded. And the third point is also that we don't want to introduce any inconsistencies at low energies. So we don't want them to, to uh, introduce any new gauge anomalies, uh, which uh, if you take into this, this into account, you are led to consider quickly vector-like fermions. Okay? And the reason is essentially that if they are in a vector-like representation of the standard model, then you can write a mass term for those in the Lagrangian and you can evade the bound on, on fermions that otherwise would be excluded if you couldn't write a mass term for them. And also it's nice that in this way, they automatically don't introduce any anomalies in the theory. Okay, so why uh, do we focus on couplings uh, of the Higgs to WW and CZ? Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is that, so this is a projection of uh, the, uh, the progress on measurement of various couplings of the, of the Higgs and the other particles in the standard model at future colliders. Okay, so, well, you can focus actually on these two uh, plots on the top left here. Uh, and those are x, x to WW and X to ZZ. And if you look closely, you see that actually those are the ones that have the prospect of being uh, better constrained at uh, future colliders. So in particular, the gray line is high Lumi. Uh, and uh, we currently know these couplings at around 10% level, let's say, order of magnitude. Uh, the prospect is for those to be constrained at around 1%, around percent level at ILUMI. And if we eventually get a future collider like FCC or even a muon collider, uh, that can go down to per mil level. And these in particular, HWW and HCZ are the ones that have the prospect of being measured in the best way uh, in the future. And uh, the second reason that, uh, that they are interesting is that they already exist in the standard model at uh, three level. And on the other hand, the contribution from these new fermions to those couplings is a loop level contribution. Okay, so like we were also discussing a couple of days ago uh, in, in the other talk. So you have this competition in a sense between a three level standard model uh, contribution and a new loop level uh, contribution that comes from beyond the standard model. Which means that uh, if you are to measure a deviation in these couplings, you know that the loop level contribution has to be quite large. Okay? Which means that the loop level, well, the coupling of these fermions to the standard model has to be, let's say, around order one for this to be observable, okay? which makes things interesting 
in terms of the instability scale. Okay, another thing that, that I uh, told you before is that uh, it, one of the nice things that I wanted to do was to try to, um, you know, take the best of a bit of the model building uh, attitude to new physics and the EFT attitude, okay? So why is this different from just the EFT, uh, you know, intuition on the scale of new physics? So the typical EFT reasoning goes in this way. So you, let's say that you imagine to have a deviation in the couplings of the ticks. And let's say that you imagine that to be generated from some operator at dimension six beyond the standard model. So then uh, you can estimate the deviation that you measure in, in this way. So some order one number, let's say times uh, V squared over lambda squared, where lambda squared or lambda is the scale where the new physics uh, actually contributes to this, to this deviation. And now you can just solve for lambda and uh, you, you, know, you associate a new physics scale to that deviation in, in this way. Now what we are, so there is this new physics scale, which already is there uh, from the EFT point of view, if you are to measure a deviation in the Higgs scale. What we are actually claiming and what we are uh, stating in this, in this work is that in addition to that, there is also another uh, new physics scale, which is the second new scale of new physics, uh, which is uh, the scale of new bosons. Okay, So new physics in general, you know, doesn't mean that you necessarily have new bosons at that scale. Uh, but there is a new boson scale, which we constrain with our work, which is bigger than the scale where you generically expect new physics lambda. So said in some other way, said in a different way, uh, you imagine uh, that you are probing already the scale lambda and you only found new fermions. Okay. And then you are asking, where should I expect new bosons beyond that, uh, given the deviation that I measured in the capital? And in general, you know, lambda b is not equal to lambda. And in general, it's bigger than lambda. Uh, but just as, as a spoiler also, uh, in the case of deviations which are measurable at high Lumi, uh, you will see that uh, uh, the, the analysis that we make implies that those two scales are roughly at the same. OK, so now that uh, I, I hope I explain more or less the logic of what I want to do, uh, let me tell you a bit more about what the various steps to actually getting this result uh, of relating the deviation in the couplings of the Higgs and the scale of new bosons is. Uh, and there are, you know, in general, let's say three different parts that uh, I can split this uh, computation. Okay, so one, one step is actually once you extended the standard model uh, with these new fermions, uh, you want to actually go ahead and calculate uh, the deviation that they induce in the couplings of the Higgs, okay? So in order to do that uh, consistently, since uh, as I told you before, these new fermions contribute at loop level, uh, at, at one loop uh, to the couplings uh, of the Higgs to WW and ZZ, the way to do this calculation consistently is to renormalize the electroweak sector of the standard model at one loop. So you have to consider the diagrams there uh, at the top. Uh, and uh, the result of this computation is that you will obtain a deviation, let's say delta mu, in this coupling, uh, which is a function of the parameters of the new fermions. Okay, so generically here, I'm writing y for the Yukawas of the new fermions and m for their masses. So in, this is, let's say that I'm calling mu the relative deviation, okay, so the, some delta g over g. Uh, then uh, this, the, the outcome of the calculation is to write this as a function of the Yukawas and the masses, and of course, other standard model uh, And okay, in order to do this renormalization procedure consistently, uh, you, you have to define the measured quantities that you are uh, basing your calculation on. And in particular, we choose these ones for, for this computation. Uh, and uh, okay, just to show you, uh, this is just to give you an example of what the final result might look like for, for, a, for a given representation of these new fermions. Uh, you see that it's kind of, in a sense, what you expect, okay? So again, uh, it, it is a function of the Yukawas and the masses of these new fermions. It increases as you increase the Yukawa coupling between the Higgs and the new fermions. And it also vanishes as you decouple 
uh, these new burdens uh, that, that you ought to be understanding. So as you increase your costs. Uh, so once again, to, to convince you that this result makes sense in, in a way, um, you can actually estimate the scaling of, of what you compute uh, in terms of these Feynman diagrams. And this procedure is typically called naive dimensional analysis. Uh, and so from if you consider the diagrams here, uh, you can estimate how the result I, I just showed you scales with the couplings of the theory. And uh, okay, so let's say from, from the diagram on the right, for example, you can uh, estimate that you need some insertions of the gauge coupling, you need some Yukawa insertions, and you also have some suppression because it's a, it's a one loop effect. And so eventually you conclude that the result has to be of this form, which actually matches uh, with what uh, with the dominant term of what I showed you on the previous on the previous slide. Okay, so this is the this was the first step of the calculation. The second step, which in a sense is actually the most important, is how do you calculate this instability scale, the, the scale at which your theory stops being consistent. Okay, and this is the scale at which the new bosons have to come in, and I will explain why you can you can make that scale. Okay, so in the theory uh, with you know standard model plus these vector like fermions, uh, you can have two different kinds of instabilities uh, that arise. So one is an instability in the Higgs quartic. Okay, so the running of the of the quartic uh, when you have these new fermions is modified in this way. You have a contribution from the Yukawas which scales like y to the four, and crucially is with a negative sign. Okay, so that's very important. Uh, so it means that the quartic of the Higgs, as you go to higher energy, uh, tends to get you know smaller and smaller, and eventually becomes negative. Okay? And when uh, the quartic becomes too negative, uh, you have a problem with the uh, with the vacuum stability. Okay, so in particular, what this means uh, is that uh, uh, well, as you know already, we know that with the parameters that we currently measure, the standard model is uh, metastable which means that we live in a metastable vacuum, uh, which is long lived enough for now. Uh, but uh, as you make the quartic uh, uh, smaller and eventually more and more negative, this uh, decay time of our vacuum uh, becomes smaller and smaller, and eventually uh, it becomes shorter than the age of the universe. So the scale at which this happens is the instability scale uh, in this picture, okay? because it's, it's inconsistent for you to have to live in a in a vacuum that has a lifetime which is shorter than the age of the universe. The second kind of, of instability that you might um, encounter in this picture is when you have that your new Yukawas grow too much. Okay, so you might have a Landau pole in the couplings of these uh, of these new fermions, and in particular, you see that now uh, the Yukawa grow grows with the as you calculated through a normalization with a term that goes like y cube. Okay, so it, uh, it's uh, driven to more and bigger and bigger values. Uh, and eventually when this becomes too large, also you can, uh, you can say that your theory uh, is uh, inconsistent at, the, at a given scale where this becomes, let's say conventionally, you might say uh, for the purpose of the calculation, I think we chose four pi, but uh, it's not very dependent on the specific value. Of, uh, uh, of the of the cutoff that you choose in the cup. So the scale, of, okay, so one point is that for both of these instabilities, crucially, this is only rectified by new bosons. Okay? So in the first case, actually, new, if you had new bosons, so not, not only new fermions, but new bosons in the theory, those would contribute with the plus sign to the, to the RGs, okay? So with the opposite sign, which means that they will not drive the Higgs quartic to be more negative. They would improve the situation uh, in terms of vacuum stability. And same thing for the Landau pole. They would contribute with the opposite sign, which means that uh, which means that these instabilities can only be rectified by new bosons. Okay? They, so adding more and more fermions will not improve your situation, which means that this instability scale you can identify with the scale at which uh, new bosons have to come in and have to save your theory. In a sense. Okay. So in practice, what we actually find uh, is that uh, 
in, in all the examples that we study, the dominant effect, which means the thing that happens at, at the lowest energy is the instability in the Higgs vortex. So that, that's the dominant kind of instability in this sort of analysis. Uh, and as I told you before, okay, this is an instability that has to do with uh, vacuum decay. So when, when the lifetime becomes too short, and you can associate the instability scale lambda b uh, with the scale at which the coupling reaches this specific value. Uh, so notice that uh, this is a negative value for the vortex. So another way to say it is, it's okay for the vortex to be negative as long as it's not too negative. Uh, so right, uh, once, once you do this, once you identify this instability scale within, through this process, what you can do is actually start to make some plots. Okay, so here, uh, let's say on the left, what I'm showing you uh, is uh, uh, what the deviation in these couplings of the Higgs is as a function of the Yukawa coupling of these new fermions. And you can see that, okay, I'm choosing the Yukawas with the, which are of order one, so they're, they're still, they are large couplings, but they are not non-perturbative. They're still uh, under under control. And you can see that you can have up to deviations that are around 1% in this particular coupling of Higgs to WW, uh, which as I told you before, is around the scale of something that can become observable at high Lumi. And... Uh, uh, so here I'm choosing various values for, for the masses of the new fermions. So the red, the red curve is 300 GV, then blue is 500 and yellow is 1 PV. This is for the lightest new fermion. And then there is another, in this particular case in which I'm taking a doublet plus singlet um, extension of the, of the standard model, then there are uh, other states, but they are heavier. So this is the lightest uh, new state in the theory, if you want. Yeah, yeah, like... yes, yes. So that's that's where, uh, well, so there is a vector like mass. This M1 is actually the physical mass, which of course is related is related to the vector like mass in the UK. Yeah, you have to have this vector like mass, otherwise, and you can't evade the experiment. And uh, okay, so and then again, the gray line, for example, is the is the line of something that will be accessible in general at uh, more future colliders. So for example, FCC or, mm -hmm. or muon colliders. On the right, instead, I'm showing you how this instability scale that I just defined changes uh, as a function of the, of the Yukawas of the new fermions. And you can see that again, I'm choosing Yukawas which are of order one uh, and uh, the instability scale for those choices is can be quite low. Okay, so you can have and so here, I, I don't know if you can read, but this is just a log of the ratio between the instability scale and the mass of the new fermions. So when the log is one, it means that this means that the instability scale is one order of magnitude above the scale of the new fermions. So when that happens, you start having problems in your theory. Okay? So in other words, your theory is problematic already for Yukawas, which are of order one, and which means that you are able to set strong constraints on the scale of new bosons, even for the Yukawas that, that are of order one. <clears throat> well, I mean, it will, this is just, uh, everything will become negative, right? So it will go to more and more negative values. So it will become big and negative, essentially from the number of bosons. So yeah. Well, no, I, yeah, I think uh, I think the same the same problem will show up uh, also for negative. Yeah, in fact, everything is symmetric actually for for P and P without. So I'm showing, yeah, I mean as you can see here, uh, and you could have shown also this plot for negative values. Everything is symmetric. And uh, the second thing that I'm showing you here in this plot is actually we wanted to see how this how sensitive this is to the measurements of uh, uh, of the parameters in the standard model. So here I'm changing the top Yukawa by one sigma uh, in terms of how much, how well it's measured right now. And you see from these bands that the effect is not that big. Okay, so 
since the instability is dominated by these Yukawas, which are quite large, they are in fact the largest couplings in the theory when the Yukawa is order, order one, uh, then uh, the instability scale is not so sensitive to the measurement of the of the of the of the cow. Um, I think in general you have a, you have a phase, right, in the in the way that you define, because there is in a sense there are two, so there are two new cows. Okay, so if you go back. So this is like you you introduce two pairs of vector like terms, right? One is a coupling Y and one with a coupling Y C. So in a sense, there is a phase between the two uh, that uh, that speaks. Uh, and uh, okay, so if we oh, then we couple them together. Uh, yeah. Then, so so there is also there is also this minus sign that can be particular for for the phase. And in that case, we also didn't take into account fully the phase, because again, in the spirit of being as conservative as possible, we, you know, we know that uh, just taking, well, if you actually take into account the constraints that come from having a phase, then you can have some, some violation that leads to stronger constraints of what the masses of experiments can be. So if you want to like, get the most conservative upper bound, it's, it's enough to consider just the sign difference. Can you show again the expression for the deviation of the coupling? Which you know, the... Yes. This one? Yeah. So, this in general is a small deviation. Yes, it's small in the sense that it, uh, you can get something which is much bigger than percent. Right. So, you cannot. So, you cannot. Uh, you have to take. So already for Yukawas that you saw were like two, for yeah. example, you have a 1% deviation. Okay, probably you are going to discuss this, uh, but if I saw uh, this a deviation from x to w, this observer that there is C, even if I do not this, probably we'll, uh, we will suspect that it has to do with three level deviations, not, not with the deviation. Because there will be a few percent of the neutral, probably the existence of neutral states are yeah. modified by mixing. Right. Well, anyway, continue. continue yeah. About so it can be, yeah, I think, uh, well, in this I mean, particular case, it cannot be three left. cannot right? be. Yeah. Just because they. I know, I know. Here they are known. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, what you was some. Yeah, so so if it was three level and it was induced by new bosons, I would be happy because that would mean that my Absolutely. new boson scale is low. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they are among the most sensitive. <laughs> to die photon, yes. So we also calculated that for some representations, but so one of the things is that uh, typically X to gamma gamma is, gives you much bigger deviation because they are also the contribution in the standard model is a uh, loop level. So you don't have this competition anymore between free and the loop. Uh, but uh, yeah, so you can, you can have something that shows up in, in H to gamma gamma. One of the things that are important is actually that in our models, we find that the dominant effect comes from these doublet plus singlet extensions of the standard model. So those are the most uh, conservative in sense. Uh, so if you want uh, if you want to be model independent, those are the kind of star extension. And uh, those don't give uh, an H gamma gamma contribution right? because of uh, just the charge. Uh, you know, you cannot write uh, the diagram, the right diagram because of the charges of the terms. You don't have enough charge space to put the so, so, okay, so you only get H, H gamma gamma from doublet plus C plus uh, triplet and above representations. So, uh, are you arguing that if I have, uh, say, Xenos and Guinos? So, I need Xenos and Guinos, I yeah. don't need Xenos and Guinos. We we'll see uh, H gamma gamma to generate H gamma. Okay, so. 
All right. So I think, uh, yeah, I showed you this already. So now let's, uh, let's talk about how, okay. So again, we're trying to be as generic as possible with the representations of these new fermions, but uh, you can, you know, you can have some arguments for why you can restrict yourself to just a limited number of representations that you have to start. So one of them is how does your results scale with color? So which color representations do you have to consider for the new term? So again, in general, I showed you how you can express the scaling of the deviation uh, in terms of the parameters of the new fermions. And you can also see how this would scale if you take a uh, higher dimensional SU3 representation. So it's just a, an overall factor of R, where R is the dimension of the SU3 representation. And then, uh, okay, so you're, you're wondering how does this scale, how does the deviation scale with the representation. Uh, so let's say you are considering the example in which uh, the, the instability is generated from the Landau pole. It comes from the Landau pole. You see that if you write also the RGs for the Landau pole uh, in terms of the S3 representation, you have a scaling with R and you can redefine your Yukawa coupling in such a way that different SU3 representations give you a fixed instability scale, okay? And this is the analogous of defining a Toft coupling uh, for this sort of theory. And now, okay, so you have this uh, rescaled Yukawa. If you write the deviation in terms of this rescaled Yukawa, uh, it looks li like something like this with an R that now is in the den denominator because you had a Y to the fourth. Uh, and then if you want this to be uh, consistent with experimental bounds, uh, this deviation has to be less than this quantity where now you're replacing the mass with the experimentally, uh, with the experimental bound on the mass. Now you see that uh, this now scales uh, with an R and an M experimental at the denominator. As you increase the SU3 representation, R gets bigger. And also these particles become more and more constrained which means that for higher SU3 representation, you're only allowed smaller and smaller deviations. Okay, so from here, you can conclude that actually, if you want to uh, calculate a conservative upper bound on the scale of new bosons, it's enough to consider vector-like laptops. Okay, so uh, vector-like fermions, which are singlets of SU3. Uh, so again, you can write the representations of these new fermions uh, in this way, where let's say that the SU2 representation and the hypercharge can be generic, but they are just singlets under SU3. And uh, there are some arguments that you can make for SU2 and for hypercharge in some cases, but there are not, um, there are not arguments that allow you in such a general way to uh, just restrict yourself to some representations. So in general, we consider multiple representations of SU2 and different values for the hypercharge. Uh, but in practice, what happens is actually that uh, when you look at our results, the strongest constraints uh, or the most general model, again, as I was telling you before, are the representations in which also the uh, SU2 representation and hypercharge are the lowest. So those will be, uh, those will be the most important model, model for our analysis. So the doublet plus singlet uh, extension. Uh, the, that depends. Uh, so there are typically three states, uh, three physical yeah, states. One, so if you call M, just let's say the vector like mass, and let's say that. Uh, yeah, there are two. Yeah, so it's like something like M plus or minus YD over square root of two. Those are the masses. So if the Yukawa is large enough, they're not quite. Uh, they can be a few about uh, yeah, so we have some, yeah, we have some experimental bounds, yeah. So I will show you a plot, I think, uh, quite soon. Yeah, so very soon. So actually, the third step in the whole process is the is to, you know, set, you know, set experimental, see exactly what the experimental constraints on this are. Uh, and so there are two kinds of constraints that you have to take into account. There are direct searches, as Leontau was saying, uh, or collider searches, but there are also uh, bounds that come from electroweak procedures. And those electroweak precision constraints uh, come from uh, typically our 
expressed in terms of the S and P parameters, the Peskin Takeuchi parameters. And just a, as a reminder of what these are, they are some parameters that uh, they are some you know, numbers that parameterize the allowed deviations from the standard model that you can have from the precision measurement uh, at left. And uh, these are already quite constraining. Uh, so you can see, for example, here, if you combine everything, uh, you have an ellipse, uh, like the blue ellipse that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, the standard model is within the ellipse. But if you have some extension, uh, generically, you will have modifications of SNP. And you have to be careful uh, to, to you know, not, uh, not go too far and, uh, and be strongly constrained by, by SNP. Uh, in in your extension of the standard model, so this is something very uh, very familiar to, for example, people that worked on let's say uh, composite peaks models. You typically have uh, deviations in S and T that are parameterized, uh, uh, let's say, as some ratio of V over F, where F is the composite mesh scale. Okay, so so the the way that you uh, apply this to our model of vector like fermions is by uh, recasting the s and bounds and the direct searches into the plane of couplings that uh, that you have for these new vector like fermions so uh, in the plane of mass versus yukawa coupling and again here i'm putting everything together so we have in gray the constraints from pre electronic precision of s and uh, and also we have some uh, uh, relevant uh, direct searches that we found so since, since you guys asked, I can explain a bit more what these are. So the, well, first of all, you can see that typically S and T are actually the dominant contributions if the fermions are not too light. So at the end of the day, those would be the most important, but uh, the direct searches come from various, uh, various things. Uh, one, you can have like the left Z width, with, uh, which is just a constraint on, uh, uh, on your fermions being, uh, uh, not being lighter than half the Z mass. Uh, then you have uh, a, a search on uh, a stable charged particles at LHC. Uh, and uh, I think those uh, those are, oh yeah, those become a problem if the lightest state in your theory is charged. So that can happen with a, when you have a, a specific uh, relationship between the masses and the Yukawas of the theory. And, uh, and then you are strongly constrained in that case. And then also here in the middle, uh, there was some uh, compressed Xeno search at Atlas that, that was relevant. And uh, well, the, the curve had a weird shape. So this is, uh, this is why also this, uh, this is kind of weird. Um, but at the end of the day, okay, yes, we did take into account direct searches, but the relevant constraints again will come from electronic process, which is not unexpected in, sense, so in, these, uh, in these extensions. And the white area is a lot, yes. Everything else uh, is constrained. Okay, so again, I'm showing this for the doublet plus singlet, which, uh, which again, is the most important model for us. But uh, in general, imagine that uh, if you take higher and higher representation, this becomes more and more constrained. This is the model, which is actually the least constrained. Uh, okay, so one thing that uh, you might wonder and that I want to discuss uh, is, okay, so you're doing this nice perturbative analysis of uh, how you are modifying the couplings of the Higgs. Uh, so everything is, uh, uh, everything is weakly coupled and perturbative, but uh, can I get around your argument by considering strong coupling? And uh, so there is, a, there is an estimate that you can make to show that uh, uh, you you are not uh, evading our bound just by considering strongly coupled theory. So the idea uh, is that again, so if you have a strongly coupled theory like composite Higgs or something, some composite dynamics, uh, then you expect a correction in the couplings of Higgs, which scales like uh, v squared over f squared, where f is the confinement scale, uh, and then you expect uh, new states, so new. Uh, new composite states at a scale which scales like some coupling times the compositeness scale. When you have strong coupling, you can estimate this to be four pi times the compositeness scale. So this is generic prediction, let's say, from strongly coupled theories. 
Uh, on the other hand, you can compare this with the deviation that uh, arises from our weakly coupled extension. So this scales in the way that I already showed you before. Uh, and if you want to compare to an equivalent strong coupling scale, then you can identify an F effective, which scales like this four pi M divided by F squared. Uh, so the statement that I'm making is that uh, we find in our results that you can extend our theories to energies which are way beyond four pi times this F effective, which means that if you are, again, in the spirit of finding the most conservative upper bound on the scale of new bosons, then uh, it's enough to consider uh, the vector like Fermi that, that we take into account. So in other words, uh, you would get um, you would get a bound from strongly coupled theory, but it would not be the upper bound on the scale of new bosons. Okay, so finally, uh, I showed you all the pieces. If you put everything together, uh, now uh, I can I can show you some plots. Okay, so again, if you put together also the two previous plots that I showed you before, you finally get a relationship between the instability scale, which is the scale of new bosons, mm -hmm. and the deviation in couplings of the Higgs. So in this first example, I'm taking uh, the lightest fermions to be, uh, let's say, a few hundred GeV to a TeV. Uh, and here, uh, so this is supposed to be darker gray, but okay, imagine this darker gray area is what's constrained by electroweak precision uh, to the right of this vertical line here. And the other line, a bit more on the left, uh, is what, uh, uh, what will be uh, possible to observe at some future colliders, uh, future lepton colliders like uh, FCC and uh, muon colliders. Okay, uh, So one first thing that you might notice uh, is that the what's observable actually at Hailumi is way to the right of this plot. Okay, so it's at around percent level, where the instability scale is already extremely low. If you imagine continuing these lines, uh, so this is the reason why uh, I made the statement that I did earlier. So from the here, you can conclude essentially that you cannot generate uh, a deviation which is observable at Hailumi with only new fermions. You also need new bosons. Okay, which means that in that case, the new boson scale is the same as the new physics scale, is the same as the scale of the new fermions. The second thing you can see is that if you consider some deviation, which is around what's measurable at future colliders, uh, now you see that the instability scale is still strongly constrained. It's uh, a couple of orders of magnitude above uh, the, the mass of these new fermions. Uh, which means that uh, if you look at the masses that I took for these new fermions in this plot, it means that the general statement that you can make in this case is that uh, new bosons in these theories will be uh, constrained to be lighter than more or less 100 TV. Or so. Okay, so it means that if you are to observe, again, deviations at some future colliders, then the new bosons are expected to be uh, below 100 TV generically. And again, this is in the case in which uh, this is the doublet plus singlet extension of the standard model. Uh, so this is the one that gives you the most conservative upper bound. All the other theories will give you uh, scales of uh, scale, scale lambda b, which is actually lower than this. Uh, so the second thing that you can do, uh, or let's say the, the opposite regime that you can choose is instead of taking these fermions to be a few hundred GV, you can try to take them as light as possible while still being consistent with the experimental bounds. So in this case, I'm taking here on the left, uh, the new fermions, the lightest new state is a 50 GV state, neutron state, neutral. Uh, and then on the right, there's uh, two states at 100 and 150 GV. So those are still allowed uh, from, from collider constraints. And you can see that especially in the plot on the left, if you do this, uh, then uh, the result is that you are able to decou decouple the, the scale of new bosons up to around even uh, uh, Planck scale, uh, sorry, like gut scale values for deviations that are observable at future colliders. But, uh, well, okay, the downside, well, not the downside, but uh, the, the compromise that you're getting in this case is that, yes, you are able to decouple the scale of new bosons, but on the other hand, to do so, you have to introduce 
light new fermions, which are themselves testable at uh, high UV, for example, or accessible at like high UV. So, so in just to summarize, you have two pictures. In, in one case, either new bosons are strongly constrained, uh, or uh, you need new fermions, which are uh, very light. So also to, to prove you that we actually did the analysis for the other SU2 and hypercharge representation, this I'm, I'm showing you here uh, the equivalent plots for HWW, but on the left, I have a three plus four extension with this, for this vector like fermions. Uh, and you can see that qualitatively everything is similar, but uh, the scale of the new bosons is even lighter uh, than what we had before, as I was telling you. And uh, on the right, uh, instead, I have doublet plus singlet, but now the hypercharge is quite large. So the charge of the light state uh, now is uh, five. Okay, so it's quite quite large, and uh, and you can see that again the scale of new of new bosons is uh, is lowered in this case. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but but actually in this case the whole plot on the right here is grayed out by electroweak precision because as you expect electroweak precision becomes uh, even stronger when, when you have charged states uh, that are lighter. And it's also interesting that uh, uh, you can see here on the left that approximately it seems like uh, the scale of new bosons for a while is independent of the amount of deviation. And that happens when uh, the instability scale is dominated by the Landau pole. Uh, in that case, the instability scale does not depend on the deviation, uh, but on the all the other regions, the parameters, the parameter space is dominated by uh, the instability identified with the quark properties. Okay, so this was for uh, HWW. Now I'll show you the equivalent plots for HZZ instead. Uh, so again, everything is qualitatively similar. Um, the difference, the main difference is that uh, just numerically, deviations in HZZ turn out to be smaller for similar Yukawas than what you get for HWW, uh, which, uh, which uh, as a consequence of that, okay, so if you want a fixed deviation, let's say 0.1, uh, this means that your Yukawas to the new fermions have to be bigger. And as a consequence of that, then the instability shows up sooner and uh, the new boson scale is lower. So the new boson scale that you might uh, deduce from uh, deviation in HCZ is lower than the one you would deduce from HWW. And again, here I'm showing you uh, new fermions that are on the left around a few hundred uh, GV and on the right as light as possible. Uh, okay, so again, this is just the equivalent plot, but, uh, but for higher representations of uh, SU2 and hypercharge and everything is qualitatively similar. So, okay, so now that I showed you everything, let me just uh, summarize and conclude. Uh, I showed you that in general, uh, if you observe a deviation uh, in HWW and HCZ at high Lumi, uh, then this requires new bosons uh, around uh, the scale that you are able to prove at the same high Lumi. On the other hand, if you are to measure a deviation at some future lepton collider, you have two options. Either you had uh, light new fermions, or you expect light new bosons around or under 100 GB. Uh, just in terms of what you might think about in the future, okay, so we did some analysis of HW, uh, sorry, H gamma gamma, uh, but we didn't uh, do the full systematic analysis by changing the representation and estimating which the best representations are. So uh, we're, we're thinking about doing that right now. Uh, and also another interesting coupling that you might study is, is this HZ gamma, which has similar uh, similar features. Okay, and just overall, I hope uh, I showed you a nice example and I convinced you that uh, measuring deviations in these couplings can be a powerful probe of the scale of new physics. And then, thank you very much. Three layer bosonic model, actually, more conservative than the three layer bosonic model when the deviation is less. Uh, well, oh, this, you mean the fermions versus some three layer bosonic model? Could you uh, see that the three layer bosonic model predicts the larger bosonic model? A required larger bosonic 
Um, as a system for the wall. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I yes. guess beyond the ones that we do. Right. Well, so so the new boson model would, would induce a deviation like uh, three levels. Right? Yeah, three levels. So yeah. probably, I would say, what's the statement? Well, that probably would be smaller. Yeah, than then it would be smaller. Tighter than two smaller. Two smaller yeah. like that would work the best you. Exactly. Uh, yes, so in some cases, the new bosons are required to be also right above the film. Right. If it's in the same line, for example. In that case, it might be better to have a three level bosons for the well, I mean, so they would for sure show up uh, before that, that scale. So this scale is the most conservative upper bound that you can do. Uh, it you want to generate, the, okay, of course it's possible. Partly for the deviation to be the yeah, better, the better, better in the sense that they can be heavy. I don't know what I meant is it could be that if the requirement from the inside is required to low bottom scale, yeah, yeah, it's sure. better to have a three yeah, level bottom yeah, 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 Lighter. Uh, I, think, I think lighter than this upper bound, right? Because you know that they have to show, they have to show earlier when they come. Sounds like a, it's like a Right, but okay. But three level, so purely, so purely on the deviation. Three, three level already implied that with new bosons. Exactly. Ah, uh, yes, but I'm talking about scale of the new bosons. So let's, for example, <laughs> take one person deviation, maybe I can right. point to the Okay, so now from the instability, I mean, it's not stupid, right? but anyway, <laughs> the, the new bottom mass is say, below 10, 10 degrees. Yeah. If you consider a three level model with the current is like four five, so may, maybe the, we can obtain a similar larger deviation than this point. Yeah, no, so I, think, I, mean. I think, as, yeah, okay, so another way to say, like, yeah, I think that as fixed deviation, then these new bosons would be lighter than what it is like by this, this argument. I, I mean, I mean, I, I was wondering if in the three level model, the new bottom mass here can be actually large for fixed deviation. I mean, uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, not without some other some other bosons showing up, because otherwise it would be very And then let's take one person deviation. So yeah. in this right panel, yeah. the new boson from the requirement of instability is around, uh, say, two dB. Oh, okay. So then let's go and up for the two dB new boson to the, and so then we can reproduce some of one percent deviation by the new gauge new boson that must above two dB and has some other one only larger than halfway to the gauge. But that's what I meant. It's this the most conservative. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me think about it. So you're saying you want well, okay, so I mean, I think so. I think you can generate a deviation with heavier bosons than this. Mm. Uh, but then you would have... Yeah, but, but then, okay. So this scale still has to be satisfied by something, right? So this is still a bound that applies to that. He just said that if there's no fermions, then I just... No, 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 fermions, just if there's no fermions, I just have a single... Then we can require to remove the requirement for the thin stability. But I mean, okay, you have no instability and uh, you're still generating, I mean, this is like, so this is like by contradiction, right? So you're kind of assuming the worst scenario. I mean, was in a sense that the bosons are as heavy as possible. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering, clearly there is worse than this in some cases where the for fixed uh, deviation, we can even take even larger bosons yeah, than but, but I think generating. I think what this is saying is that you cannot generate such a deviation without bosons at least at that scale. At that scale, it's a general it's a requirement in the Fermi model. What I mean, they just forget about this model and they introduce three other bosonic yeah, models yeah. and take the bosonic boson mass larger than the requirement in this Fermi model. So then, can we introduce the I think the statement is that the deviation would be smaller. I mean, it would be smaller. Uh, bigger, uh, three less passes, uh, uh, yeah. it's not clear. Uh, 
Yeah. Maybe I have to keep the 